So uh, <clears throat> that blessed arrangement, <laughs> that dream within a dream. Some of you are tracking with me. You've got the impressive clergyman in your head. I'd just like to point out that was a forced marriage that was going on, and that's not what we're going to try to talk about this morning. Um, but what I would like to, to put on display is the, the next slide, and I suppose I can do that. Um, I, I want to give I, I want to give a moment for us to just hear the words of this passage. They're not the words you're going to hear anywhere else, and uh, we're going to alternate reading them, and uh, hopefully you will be able to, to hear what God is saying through his word. So, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands, uh, to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. All right, before we go on, I think we need to light Karen up here. Yep. Yep. Me. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> Is that man harassing you? <laughs> no, he's not. Okay, hey, woo, I'm on. Okay, we're all good. You are so on. <laughs> all right, um, if we could move to the next slide, I, I want to I wanna tell you about. Uh, a day that was a really great day. Um, this is Karen and I on our, the, thank you, that was nice, um, on our wedding day. And uh, my favorite moment related to our wedding actually uh, uh, happened a few years later. Uh, when we got married, I was working for a small startup company. There weren't very many employees, so I invited all of them. But we added some more employees later, and one who had joined after our wedding came to me one day and said, yeah, I was talking to this guy about, about your wedding, and uh, he said, yeah, you should have been there. Jesus got credit for everything. And I was like, that's so awesome. <laughs> I was really excited. But it was also a really, really good day. And when Karen and I left, you know, the recessional plays and, and we leave, and uh, we kind of look at each other and go, man, I could do that again. And I have to tell you, I, I don't know that Karen's feeling like that about a second service this morning. So <laughs> if, if you want to pray for endurance for her, that would be, that would be welcome. But the, the first verse that, that we've included here, some people group it with the passage before, and some people group it with the passage after. With Paul, it's always a little hard to tell because He's putting a lot of different ideas together. It says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Who's the one another? The one another that he's talking about is the church. So look around. Look around. Okay. Hopefully you see somebody in this room that you know. And if you do, I'd just like you to think to yourself, would I submit to them? It's okay to not feel okay about that. It's not natural. But that's what Paul is talking about. He's talking about an unnatural degree 
of connection that happens within the body of Christ. So we are to submit to one another, and we're not to do it because we think each other is awesome, because we're part of the same club or gang, because, um, you know, we get, get fist bumps aplenty. I, I don't know what, what somebody's motivation would be. But out of reverence to Christ, so how, how do we do that? Well, I'm not going to answer that question very directly. Tim preached a great sermon on that subject, actually, last week. He went through 40 verses that talked about different ways in which uh, the, the body acts. But I do want to say this idea of submission within the body of Christ is not one that's only here. Paul talks about it in his letter to the Galatians. Peter talks about it in one of his epistles. He says, you, you've got to interact with humility. You've got to understand that, that you know, you're not all that here. We're all that together. And what did we talk about at the beginning of this series? We are subjects of King Jesus King, and that's what lights us up. So, marriage is an application of last week's sermon, whether you are married or not. And that's really an important issue at this church. If you've been at the nine o'clock service, you will notice that there are a lot of people who are widows or widowers. And if you've been to this service, you know there are a lot of people who have never before been married. So is this a waste of time Sunday for those people? No. And I'll tell you why. There's a lot of information out there about marriage. There are a lot of pictures out there about marriage. This is the only place I know of that you can go this week and have somebody tell you that marriage is about the gospel. I know I'm going to go through the rest of my week and nobody's going to reinforce that in any way in my life. So Christian marriage pictures the gospel. It's a demonstration for the people within the marriage. It's also a demonstration for the people outside the marriage. So our children get a view of what the gospel is like by the grace with which we interact with each other. And if, if you are a person with marital experience, good or bad, one of the things you have to do is keep in mind Paul's saying the thing about marriage is Christ and the church, the gospel. And so whatever damage you've brought, that's not what marriage is about. God has a way more amazing uh, picture for us to be a part of. So I want to leave with uh, one more picture. So uh, Karen and I standing up there at the, the steps and uh, somebody singing. We were worshiping God. It was a great moment. And uh, it was part of a, a wonderful day in which we got to become husband and wife. So how about some words from you? All right. My turn. Um, so Mike was talking about how uh, we are supposed to submit to one another in Christ, right? Out of reverence for Christ. And marriage is a specific application of that, right? I want to reread verse 22. It says, wives, submit yourself to your own husband as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. Now, as, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything, right? We listen to those words, and that's, they're hard words for women, especially, you know, with uh, the current state of women feminism and all that stuff. Uh, but I want to just talk about some of the misconceptions of submission. Um, so first of all, this passage tells me that my role as a wife uh, submitting to her husband is supposed to parallel that of the church submitting to Christ. Okay, I think we can all agree that the church submitting to Christ is a really good thing, right? Okay, and if we don't submit to Christ, we are really good at messing things up, right? And a church, this church, I hope, that is fully submitted to the Lordship of Christ can accomplish amazing things, right, in this world for God's glory. And apparently, our marriage is supposed to mirror that reality, 
where I am fully submitted to my husband so that I can accomplish amazing things in this world for God's glory. Okay, I have to think about that for a little bit, but um, the problem is for most women, submission is a neutral word at best, and for many women, it is a negative word, right? They don't even want to go there or think about it, um, and that's hard. Um, but what we really need is a better understanding of biblical submission. So today I'm going to talk about what it's not, what it is, and why it gets such a bad rap. All right, so first uh, we need to address our theology. And there's one major misconception out there. Some theologians believe that submission in marriage is a direct outcome of the fall, a consequence for the curse of sin that is reversed in the gospel. Okay, and if you've been in church, you know that in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, right? They sin, and God gives consequences. And to Eve, he says, right, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. That's her consequence. The problem is, though, that God had already created the order of headship in Genesis 2 before the fall. So you can't really go with that argument. And then we also know that in the New Testament, there are count, countless, there are many verses that describe that wives should submit to their husbands, right? So we know that's in this passage, it's in 1 Corinthians 11.3, it's in 1 Peter 3.1 and others. And so therefore submission has to be an aspect of the gospel and not something that needs to be reversed. Okay, so I'll make that clear. <laughs> All right. But we're so flawed. We are flawed. <laughs> it's scary. What are we going to do? All right. First, we're going to understand what submission is not. All right. So first of all, submission does not mean that a wife is inferior to her husband. Amen. Okay. Uh, husbands and wives are equally uh, valued by God, equally loved by Jesus, each equally gifted by the Spirit. They're co-heirs with Christ and have equal access to the Father. Okay? So that's the first thing. Second thing, submission does not mean forced compliance. Okay? That's where it really goes wrong. But by very definition, submission is a voluntary act. When I submit to Christ, I choose to place my life under his lordship. And when I submit to Mike, I choose to place my life under his loving leadership. And a husband should never force his wife to submit by coercion or manipulation. Amen. All right. <laughs> Thanks for agreeing. All right. <laughs> uh, next, uh, submission was also never meant to mean that we don't get to use our God-given intellect. Right? We don't just turn out and nod at our husband. Okay, yes, dear, that's fine, dear. Right? When we submit to God, uh, we are doing so with the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ. So, too, when I submit to Mike, I'm doing so in the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ. All right, one last thing. Submission never requires a wife to follow her husband into sin right? Um, in the book Adorned by Nancy Wogelmoss, she says, your ultimate allegiance and loyalty are to Christ. If your husband abuses his God-given authority and requires of you something that is contrary to the word and will of God, you must obey God rather than your husband. And according to First Peter, right, when our husbands uh, are in sin, which they will be, and which I will be, right? We all fall short. Um, my job then is not to retaliate or shut down or put off, but is to be a counterexample of Christ in my home. And I can do that without saying a word, right? Um, that's what it instructs us to do in First Peter. All right, I do need to say, I don't know uh, many of you in the room, but if anyone is in a difficult relationship, and I've known plenty of women in the situation where they are actually in an abusive relationship, um, if that is your case, then you need to get help and guidance. And if you, or if you had children and you ever feel threatened or harmed, then you need to get uh, 
help from both the civil authorities and the spiritual authorities for protection, right? And I base that on Jesus' example. Jesus never submitted himself to an abusive relationship until he went to the cross. Prior to that, right, people wanted to throw him off a cliff, he walked away. Pharisees wanted to kill him, he went out to safe places, he left. Okay, so we have that example for us. All right, but if we are honest, really women, if we're honest, our struggle with submission is more about uh, that we don't want to be led in a way we don't prefer or just don't think is best. And if we're really honest, it's more about wanting to be in control. We like to be in control, and I am, I confess, I am one of those people. Um, but here is our definition of biblical submission. Uh, so listen carefully. It's just that it's being willing to give up control and follow someone else's lead, whether Christ or your husband, right? So if you're single, that's what you get to practice. You get to practice giving up control and following Christ's lead. And then if you're married, then you get to do that um, with your husband as well. All right. Now, most of you in the room, there are some of you who know me really well in here, but a lot of you don't. Uh, but if you don't know me, I really like to lead. Um, you know, sign me up. I'm volunteering to, to take charge. Um, when Mike and I were engaged, we uh, decided to take dance lessons. We haven't done that since, but it was really fun. We've, we had a great time. We had this a lovely old lady, and she helped us choreograph our first dance for our wedding. And it was beautiful. And so we got to our wedding, and you've seen some pictures, but you know, 200 plus people watching, and the music went on, and we started to move, and Mike was off the beat. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm smiling with gritted teeth, trying to get him back on track. One, two, three. <laughs> and it's not working, right? And so I'm getting irritated. All these people are watching. And so what did I do? I started to lead. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, I was leading because he was wrong, right? But really, <laughs> I was wrong in the way I responded. So honestly, if I could do it all over again, this is what I would have done. I would have let Mike lead and enjoyed the dance. Who cares if we were on the beat or not? <laughs> I'd uh, like to argue that we would have gotten on the beat if we weren't fighting each other. Absolutely. <laughs> the outcome would have been better. It plays out on a zillion ways, by the way. So when we drive somewhere, Mike picks the route. <laughs> He's James Bond. He picks the route. <laughs> And doesn't matter how long it takes us to get somewhere, so. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Just keep speaking the truth, honey. All right. <laughs> All right. So those are little light examples, but many women want to know what to do when they disagree with their husband's decisions or directions. Right? And this can have a much bigger impact. So uh, that is when submission is really tested. Right. So when Mike and I were first parents, um, we had little Calvin at home. He's like one or two, and we definitely disagreed in some cases on how to parent him. And it's not untypical. I thought Mike was too critical and harsh, and I know he thought I was too lenient. Uh, the big problem was, though, in my heart, though, I felt like I needed to protect poor little Calvin and not really partner with Mike. And so when we tried to have these conversations, my words ended up being kind of biting and critical, and we were just kind of butted heads and didn't really get anywhere. Um, and so, you know, what am, I, what am I supposed to do there in terms of submission? I was not submitting to his lead in that area. Um, so the first thing, it's always a good idea, is I confided in a couple of close friends, and I had them pray with me. I needed some support and help in the situation. And it's important, I want you to know that we don't have to figure out submission in a vacuum all by ourselves, right? So we can combine in a couple of close friends, but we also don't just, you know, talk to everybody about it, post it on Facebook, hey, what do you think? How do I sell this, right? Uh, <laughs> that's very disrespectful. All right, so then, you know, then I start to submit the situation to God. And as I did that, a couple things happened. I started listening a lot more and talking a lot less. 
and I started to understand where Mike was coming from. And as I did that, as much as I hate to admit it, I realized he was right, that Calvin did need discipline in those areas. Um, and I needed to partner with him in that. Um, and the cool thing is that Christ is the head of Mike, and Christ was working on Mike's heart at the same time. And I'm praying for that, right? But it was neat to see God just move in little ways in Mike's heart just to change maybe the tone of how he disciplined or the motives for disciplining so that we could really come together and agree in that area. All right. Uh, so if you are married and you are a wife, is there an issue or an area of your life where you are currently at odds with your husband? And if so, are you willing to move towards humility, unity, and submission? And then specifically, give it some action. What steps will you take? Really pray about that. And then wives, do you trust Christ's headship over your husband and believe that God is actively moving in his life? I don't get to change Mike right? That's God's job. I don't get to change his mind about anything. All right, so one last thing about submission is that it often means that we get to receive a blessing that we wouldn't otherwise give ourselves, right? So when in, that's true in my relationship with Christ. Sometimes Christ just blows me away, right, with the good things he wants to give me. And so that should be true in our marriage, so one last quick example, again, when we had little kids, though, I, Naomi was born, that was our second child, totally exhausted. If you haven't had kids, maybe you babysat, it's exhausting. And um, I didn't have many breaks. So Mike said, hey, let's hire a babysitter, get you some time away. And I'm really cheap, we we're on a really tight budget, and so I kept resisting. Um, but finally I gave in, and so for two hours every week I'd go to Starbucks, and I'd spend uninterrupted time with God. And that time was so life-giving to me. It was like the thing, one of the things I really looked forward to. And so submission at its best, right, should be life-giving and put God's love for me on display. Yeah. All right, so uh, Nancy Walgamuth uh, describes it well when she says, the submission of Christian wives to their husbands is a powerful and beautiful picture of the son's submission to his father and the church's submission to Christ. And these wives, together with husbands who love them selflessly and sacrificially, put the gospel story on vivid and compelling display. Mm -hmm showing off the gospel that's that's what we should be about uh, in every aspect of our lives there's a there's another wedding picture that i want to show it 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 deals with a moment that happens in in any traditional uh, wedding where everybody's ready the all is in the right place uh, maybe the organist is still playing something but the bride isn't ready yet and depending on how militant your, your church people are, that could take a while or not. Um, but pretty much the service is suspended. We're waiting for the, the next big thing to happen. And as we think about Christ and the church, I just want to want to tell you, remember, as we're talking about marriage, we're talking about Christ and the church. And what's the state of the church? We're, we're waiting. We're waiting. The, the, so the, the, the bridegroom is ready, but the bride still needs some development. She still needs more people to join her. So as we are part of the church community together, we are part of a development that this specific marriage relationship where each person is investing in the other is, is a more specific model of the kind of thing that should be going on organically among the people of Christ. Do you follow that? That this kind of submit to one another, as in verse 21, and then Karen's talked about a, a wife submitting to a husband, this is part of God's plan for how his people grow together, which is pretty amazing. Husbands, you know, we've got this really easy task. Um, 
we get our script at the tryout, and it turns out that we're Jesus. <laughs> Everybody ready? <laughs> you know, like, Karen, have you ever mistaken me for Jesus? Absolutely. <laughs> So I'll just interject that I didn't know when I first met Karen at a Bible study that she spoke my love language, which is sarcasm, but you, you, you just got to enjoy it there. Um, okay, but, but what did Christ do the, for the church? He laid down his life. What are husbands to do for their wives? They're to lay down their lives. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You know, like, um, got, got some marching orders for us from there? Well, first thing is, let's, let's look at where we start. I think we start one of two places, um, or possibly both. Uh, if I say, I love me, you following me? I love me. I can't sing, but you know that's a message that is continuously out there. It's not just Megan Trainer singing it. Every one of us has a little choir in our hearts that says, you know what? I love me. I understand my preferences so well. My desires, my hopes for the future, my annoyances. I love me. And suddenly you throw in somebody that you're supposed to be Christ to, and all of that just gets blown up. Suddenly, I'm not playing video games in mom and dad's basement anymore. <laughs> you got to be honest about where you are. Okay, that's one, one take. The other take is you should go and love yourself. And this happens oftentimes when somebody, and I'm going to say a husband in this case, has, has said, you know what, I'm going to try to not lock in on me. I'm going to try to focus on you as best I can. It doesn't go well. And there's resistance. And there's not the response that we wanted. And so suddenly it's like, you know what? I was singing my little me song fantastically, and then you came in and just harshed my mellow, and you're on your own. You can suffer without the glory that is me for a little bit. <laughs> I know, it's unthinkable, isn't it? <laughs> if your love language isn't sarcasm, I really apologize for that last whole little, little bit there. The, the point is that laying down your life has this fundamental appearance to it, which is the stuff that, that I want, I have to hold it with at best an open hand because I now am part of a new flesh that's been combined and we don't have just that Mike set of stuff. We've got Mike and Karen set of stuff. And guess what? Even the Mike stuff and the Karen stuff, when you combine them, it's not the same as what Jesus wants for Mike and Karen. And so we've got this this stuff, and I've got to go, okay, all right, I don't get to be as in control of my own life as I want, and I also don't get to control her life as I might be inclined to. Husbands illustrate the gospel by partnering with Jesus to help their wives become holy and blameless, and everybody who feels like they've got the power to do that, raise your hand. Okay, me neither. Um, I can't make Karen holy and blameless. But you know what? As she said, what I could do was go, you, we know some teenagers who need some, some extra coin. Maybe some time away from the kids would, you know, help your, your mental and spiritual state because <laughs> they're too much. It didn't take, you know, genius level insight for me to see that. But it, it was there and I might have ignored it. So how, how does she become more holy and blameless out of that situation? Well, guess what? You get a little break from the kids. When you see the kids again, you are more capable of dealing with them. 
Um, there are things that, that we share about our day every day. It's part of our, our routine, and it's part of our coping mechanism. If, if I'm out of town, the thing I hate is being in a really messed up time zone where we can't do that, because I don't know how to process on my own anymore. Um, which, you know, in a way is a loss, but net, it's a, it's a huge advantage. Um, but fundamentally, what I want to be doing is purposefully looking for God's purpose in Karen's life, which means I've got to take responsibility for her development that I wouldn't normally do. And I've met so many guys who, if they've got employees, they are diligently pursuing their employees' development. Oh, you need this set of skills, you need this exposure to this, you need to try this. When we get home, we got nothing but a shrug. We're not engaged enough to do that. We're not thinking along those lines of, this is a person that I have some responsibility for, and Christ wants to build something into her, uh, has purpose for her life. The other part is patiently responding with peace to provocation. Okay, so um, when, when you enter a time of robust dialogue, <laughs> You don't have to be married to know what that's all about. How we respond in those times of, of combat, even if it's gentle combat, loving combat, engaged combat, um, <laughs> it really matters. And for Karen and I, the, one of the big problems was I have a very sharp tongue. I don't always filter with my brain, so the sharp tongue acts on its own. It's almost like there's a book in the Bible that talks about how bad that is, but <laughs> until I was married, I didn't have someone the victim of it every single day. And so my solution to, to that behavior on my part was if things got heated enough that I wanted to zing, I would retreat. And this didn't make Karen feel protected, it made her feel abandoned. But I didn't know that at first. I couldn't conceive of that at first. Of course you want the guy with the loaded tongue gun to exit the stage when, when he's going to start shooting it. Is that a beautiful image? That's a beautiful image. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so my point is that the, the way that we interact with our wives requires us, again, to be laying down all those understandings that we have of the world that don't take her into account which means we've got to be talking to her about what works and what doesn't work. And ideally, we purposefully do that at times when we are not already feeling defensive. All right, I'm throwing that down. I hope you're picking it up. John Chrysostom, uh, one of the church fathers, said, let us make her fair in God's sight, not in our own. She is not a blank canvas when you marry her. She's a person and you're never gonna erase what came before, and you shouldn't want to. If things need to be erased, only God has the power to do that in a way that's okay. But God has development that he wants to do in your spouse, guys, whether you have any idea who she is yet or not. And that means that you are going to have to put down some of your preferences for, say, how well she closes the cabinet doors um, in, in order to uh, be able to accept what God wants to give you and how you can contribute to her being fair. This picture is uh, my helping Karen put on her bib, her wedding bib. I don't know if anybody else has a wedding bib, but uh, you had a wedding bib, and it was supposed to keep the wedding dress without spot or stain. It's not the best image in the world, but how many of you have a wedding bib? Okay. How many of you have a spouse who is, is going to make mistakes? And how many of us, when she makes mistakes, are part of a compounding process rather than the grace of the gospel that says, you don't have to be perfect for me to love you. My job is to love you. Oh, only Jesus does that. Okay, husbands illustrate the gospel by cherishing and nourishing their wives. 
Uh, that doesn't just mean putting food on the table, though that's not a bad idea. Um, and I've already said that your bride is not a blank slate, but I also want to say that your bride will not solve all your problems. This is too much weight to put upon her, and it creates a condition for you as a husband that says, unless you fulfill my obligations, I'm going to withhold my love. And any time you catch yourself doing anything that smells remotely like that, you got to take that to God and you got to find somebody who can be in your life that you can say, I'm a little about me today and here's how it played out. Can, can you help me take this seriously? You have permission to ask me about it later. Tim Riley said something great last week about this. Christians are conduits, not creators of grace, which means <laughs> you are not a tank of grace that can just operate independently. So you're not a well where the water just comes out. You are instead a cistern, which is a tank, a holding tank. How does it get filled? God puts grace in. That's the gospel. The grace comes from God. And then I get to share it with Karen because God gives it to me, not because I'm more gracious. There aren't graciousness exercises that are going to fill me with what Karen needs. There is a Holy Spirit who will fill me with what I need to give Karen. Finally, husbands illustrate the gospel by loving their wives as their own flesh. Um, so I, I make sure that she's filled up on creatine and as much protein powder as she can <laughs> stomach, which is hard because she's got a dairy allergy and it's mostly from milk products, so it's... Right, going bad. Yeah, it's a, a really tough time. Now, a better way, better way than supplements. Um, Gary Chapman, does this ring any bells for anybody? Okay, some nods, a couple of grins. This is a guy who has a, a, a whole book writing career that's based on basically five things, five love languages. I said mine's sarcasm. It's not on his list, oddly enough. Um, and and I'll, I'll show you a picture that, that may help you see them in a moment. But he says, how do you discover your spouse's primary love language? Listen to his or her complaints. Complaints. Uh, if you've ever worked in customer service, you know complaints are actually a really useful feedback mechanism. They, they tell you something significant. If you respond to them, you increase the overall satisfaction of all your customers. We've got one customer in a marriage relationship, thank God. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so listening rather than, as he says, typically we, we get defensive when our spouse complains. So instead of doing that, here's what we do. We listen to what their complaints about. What are their complaints about? Are they seeking for words of affirmation? There's a, there's a quote mark on the next uh, slide that, that shows that. Words of affirmation. You did a great job of uh, making sure that the kids were prepared for the thing they had to be prepared for. You did an amazing job loving that person who I just wanted to, you know, straight arm. Um, that's probably more likely in our case. Uh, the next one is gifts. Um, Karen doesn't care that much about gifts. Uh, that, that's not her thing, but some women want a gift that you've thought about and took her into consideration, and that's going to feed her in a way that you may or may not understand. The acts is not, okay, it's not part of actual love, like acts of service. It's, it's an abbreviation. <laughs> All right. We're not snicker snack. Uh, uh, it's nonviolence here, but you're going to remember the acts of service, aren't you? <laughs> Okay, Karen does this for me. She, she takes care of some logistical things so that I have time to do whatever, be, be by myself, concentrate on some schoolwork, whatever it might be. Uh, Karen's are more the last two. So quality time, that's what the clock is. Um, she really appreciates time that we spend. So the, the end of the day, uh, talking about our days, it, it feeds both of us. It helps us know where each other are. It, it sometimes leads to, to prayer about specific things. And then physical touch. And, and this is one where I can specifically say the cost for me of Karen's desire for physical touch, this being a, one of her love languages, is I'd better not get a job where I'm traveling 30% of the time. 
because while we can FaceTime or call or text and words of affirmation or maybe quality time could be gotten that way, physical touch can't be. And so it means I've got a responsibility to her to, to cherish her in that way and nourish her in that way with um, not just my presence but my touch because that's what she's for. And then one more picture. Um, when, when you fill up your bride, you, you want to get a smile like that. And that's Karen down at the, the end of the, the aisle as her father was bringing her up to, to meet me at the front. Um, it's probably time that you said something. <laughs> <laughs> Take this to a little more serious level. All right. No, it's all good. But um, So that right there, that was a great day. Um, and I just want to give God all the credit. I am super grateful that I got to marry Mike. Uh, he really does lay down his life well for me and loves me really well. Um, but whether Mike does his job or not, my job given be to me by Christ is to respect him, right? So if you are single, please look for someone that you can respect. It's a huge thing, right? Preach. Um, <laughs> uh, now, there's, been, there's whole books written on this topic. We don't have time to talk about that, so we're going to talk about three things. Respecting our spouses uh, in our decisions, in our words, and in our priorities. And we're going to start with decisions, all right? So, whether you're single or married, Jesus modeled this really well, okay? So, uh, he didn't make decisions on his own. We know that before he chose the 12 disciples, he spent all night in prayer talking to God, right? So he's making decisions in concert with his father. Uh, in John 5, we learn he did nothing on his own initiative, but only did what the father showed him. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, when he knew that he was about to go to the cross, he said to God, is there any other way? And then he said, not my will, but your will be done. And those were all decisions he made, not independently, but dependent on the Father. Mm -hmm. And so if you're single, you want to start developing that habit, right, of making those decisions um, independence on God. Uh, but if uh, you're married, right, then I no longer get to make decisions on my own, right? I need to, we need to work those things out together. All right. Now, this is easy to say and hard to do. So, and I'm teaching, so I have to ask myself, do I do that? Do I check in with Mike before I make a decision, especially one that impacts him? And almost every decision I make impacts him. Okay, so I mess this one up quite a bit. And when I do it badly, here's how it goes. I usually really want to do something, have coffee with a friend, lead a Bible study, watch a TV show, and sometimes I genuinely just, I just forget. But sometimes, like, I just really don't want to know what his answer is, right? So I go ahead and put it on the calendar, and then, oh, yeah, go by the way. Yeah, I'm doing this thing over here, right? Which is not really respectful of his time or his energy, because if I do something, that means he's cooking dinner, he's got the kids, right? Or even his love for me. Right? So the way that it goes when I do it well is I say, hey, Mike, I'd really like to go to coffee with so-and-so on Monday night. Does that work for you? Right? It works for me, but does that work? Absolutely. Yay. Woo. I get the coffee. All right. <laughs> so we're good there. Um, so anyway, that's when it goes well. But the other thing is, so those are the day-to-day -day decisions, right? But we have these big decisions to make what ministries to pursue, what do jobs to take, uh, where we're going to go on vacation, right? There's a zillion big decisions. And so those decisions happen with, like, discussion, time, and prayer. All right, so I want to give you an example, because sometimes those decisions are hard, right? Maybe just even in your own life as a single person. Um, but currently, Mike is on track to move out of his well-paying, high-tech job and take a job in full-time ministry. If you know anything about full-time ministry, it doesn't pay so much, so <laughs> I know. <laughs> we are on like the downwardly mobile track. <laughs> That's where we are headed. Um, 
Uh, and, you know, I joke about it, but we live in a very expensive area. I know you're all aware of that. And so we have two kids who are going to move into college, right? We have to think about these things. And so it has felt scary at times. Um, but really, respecting Mike's decision, really our decision in this area, hasn't been that hard. And so we were talking about this. I was like, why is that? And he brought up some good points. So his first point actually was that by God's grace, I don't actually have an agenda for Mike. And I don't need Mike to make a certain income. And the reason is that's true is because I've already seen God radically take my own life and submission to him and I gave up a high paying job and I took a teaching job that paid half the salary and I watched God provide like over and over and over again. So I'm not scared about that. Um, so again, if you're young, those decisions now will impact what happens later, right? Which is actually kind of exciting. Um, the second thing is that when we got married and even in marital counseling, we agreed that we would be surrendered, that we always wanted to do what God wanted. And so as we prayed about this decision and the spirit brings unity, then we both came to the same conclusion that, yes, this was in fact the path that we think God has for Mike and feel like that's true. And the other thing, because Mike talked about laying down his life, and he laid down his life for me and for our kids. For years, he was in a job that he didn't like. And that meant the world to me. And he did develop me, and he allowed me to pursue ministry interests and all these other things. And so when God asked me to lay down my life for Mike and take a job that felt scary and I wasn't even sure if I was going to like so I'd have income so he could do the full-time ministry, that works, right? And God's teaching me and growing me in that new role um, as a teacher at a middle school. That's where God has me right now, right? And that one-time decision made six years ago has a zillion right other decisions, so that means he needs to spend all day studying. The stacks of books he gets for seminary are huge, which means he's not available. So I'm on with the kids. But those are costs we've agreed to. And so rather than whining or complaining or going to self-pity, right, I can just trust God's going to give me the strength and energy to do those things. And then I get to keep respecting his decision, right, which is really cool. All right. So that's our decisions. All right, we also need to respect each other with our words. Um, in the book, A Love and Respect, speaks about how disrespected husbands feel when their wives criticize, nag, put down, or don't approve of them. I had a friend once who said she had the spiritual gift of nagging. Okay, <laughs> clue in, that is not a spiritual gift. It does not help. Uh, this author says for husbands, when they do that, it feels like the very air they are breathing is being cut off, right? And then you go through this cycle. They don't uh, feel respected. It's hard for them to love their wives, and it's really hard to get out of that. Um, so what is a wife supposed to do? And these aren't examples from her own marriage, but just ones I've heard about, you know. So they trash the wife, ask the husband to take out the trash five times and still sitting by the door. She's getting angrier and angrier. Or they're at the Thanksgiving dinner table and her husband said something that's just really irritates her the wrong way. And it's hard to know what to do in these real life situations, right? And so often women feel like they have two choices. They can be silent and be resentful, or they can speak up and usually the words coming out of their mouth aren't very respectful or kind. And it leaves no room for God, right, in those situations. Um, so early on in our marriage, God made it really clear to me, and I'm talking like weeks one and two, um, <laughs> that I was not supposed to stew in critical thought about Mike. Despite Why is all the provocation. Oh, brother. <laughs> anyway, um, so he gave me two choices. I could speak up or I could pray. That was it. Those were the two choices, but I could not just be stewing over and mulling over the thing he did wrong and sowing seeds of bitterness in my heart and in my mind. And if I was to speak up because there was sin I perceived in his life, then I was supposed to do so, one, in private, as is told in Matthew 18, 
and two, gently and with a heart to restore him to right uh, living, right? Galatians 6.1. Okay, so now we've been married 17 and a half years. I am still learning how to do this, right? It takes a long time. I'm sure I will continue to learn. Um, but it's good. Uh, so in regards with our words, Tim gave a great verse. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Right? So whether you're married or not, we all get to practice building up others up with our words. And wives, uh, if you are married, is that what you're doing? Do your words build him up? Do they encourage him? Um, is it God glorifying? All right. One last thing. I need to uh, respect Mike's needs and make him a priority, right? Philippians 4, 3 through 4 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. So it doesn't get to be all about me. <laughs> all right, and this plays out a thousand different ways. Um, so a couple in our marriage... Uh, so first of all, if you know me, I, I love to go to the beach and I love to camp, right? Mike does not love those things at all. Um, and so early on in our marriage, my idea was, was I would drag Mike along and somehow that would work out. But usually how it worked out was Mike sat on the beach getting bright red, feeling very <laughs> uncomfortable and very grumpy and nobody had a good time. It was not good. Um, so then, as time went on, though, Mike learned one of the ways he could lay down his life would be go camping or go to the beach, and he actually learned to enjoy it, which was a really cool thing. But I also learned that I didn't ha he didn't have to do those things with me. I have friends who love to go to the beach, so now I mostly go to the beach with them, right? And then when we go to the beach, we love to walk along the coast of Pacific Grove, and he's not in the hot sun with the sand, and it works out for everybody. <laughs> um, okay, another really important example. Um, early on in our marriage, I was very naive, and I'm not sure how, um, but how important sexual intimacy was to Mike and to most, both, most gen men in general. Um, and unfortunately, as a single person, I had made some bad choices in regards to sexuality. And so I brought a lot of baggage into our marriage. I honestly had no idea uh, that I had done that. Um, so when we got married, um, surprisingly enough to me, I kind of shut down to sexual intimacy. And it was really sad. It was really hard for Mike. And it did not respect him. Uh, but thankfully, we have a God who is active and powerful and transforming and healing. And so through prayer and counseling and a lot of work and a couple of years of just kind of really hard stuff, actually, um, God did a miracle in my heart and life and healed that area in my heart and restored our marriage um, in a way that made intimacy just beautiful and sweet and holy and what it was intended to me. Um, so I just want to quote one guy. So uh, Gary Thomas, he's author of Sacred Romance, he points out, a man's sexual need is the only need he has no other way of legitimately meeting except through a loving spouse. All right, so a couple examples. Um, if you are married... Wives, how can you put your husband's needs ahead of your own this week, right? All right. Um, there are women, and hopefully if you're single, this won't be you, but I know plenty of women who got married and then realized they were stuck in a really difficult marriage. Um, and in those cases, submission feels really hard, and respect feels even harder because they don't feel like uh, their husbands are really genuinely worthy of their respect. And if you're sitting in that room and you're thinking, that's me, then my heart just aches for you. It's a really hard circumstance, and you need a lot of support and guidance from the church. 
and people who love you when your husband can't love you. That's your husband's not supposed to meet all your needs, right? But I love this quote. Um, it's from Dan Allender and Trumper Longman III. He just says, marriage requires a radical, radical commitment to love your spouses as they are while longing for them to become what they are not yet. Every marriage moves either towards enhancing one another's glory or towards degrading each other. Okay, and then another quote from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Goethe. <laughs> oh, however you say it. If you treat a man the way he is, he will stay as he is. But if you treat him as if he were what he ought to be or could be, which if he is a Christian, is a new creation in Christ, right? He will become the bigger and better man. So Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, not after we cleaned up our act, right? So as wise, we need to love our husbands and husbands, same thing. We need to love each other when we're sinning, um, not retaliate, not do those kinds of things. All right. Um, all right, one last thing. So I have a lot of friends who have expressed or complained that their husbands have not been the spiritual leaders that they hope for them to be. And for that, some of them, that has been a really deep longing. But here's the problem. What I've seen is that when their husbands initiate, take the lead, take a risk, have an idea, often that is met with uh, criticism or rejection, right? And that doesn't encourage leadership. That shuts it down. Um, so wives, if you are married, how are you encouraging your husband to be a spiritual leader? Um, that's what he's supposed to be. Well, so when marriage works the way God intends, we, Mike and I, and whoever's married, gets to put the gospel on display for all to see. That should be exciting for us, right? So every time Mike lays down his life for me, he puts the gospel on display, just like Jesus laid down his life for all of us. And every time I receive the gift of his leadership and submit to that leadership, I'm displaying the gospel. Because guess what? Now I don't have to figure out life on my own anymore. And that's one of the great gifts God gives me. And every time Mike works to nourish and cherish me, he showcases God's love for me, right? And to the world. And when I respect him in his decisions and build him up with my words and prioritize himself, him above myself, I am practicing the character of Christ. And every time we forgive each other, we live the gospel. And every time we try to help each other look a little bit more like Jesus, that's the gospel. And so this is our prayer for you who are married and for those who want to be married, that our marriages may bring glory to our God who loves us and gives us the power and the strength to live marriages out in a radically different way. So let's pray. God, thank you for loving us when we were unlovable for pursuing us when we weren't interested and for continuing to care for us and shepherd us through lots of mistakes, lots of rebellion, lots of not getting it. And I ask that as your people, you would make us people who would be responsive to your word, responsive to your plan, and that we would show off in our marriages and our expectations of marriages the gospel that you have given to us through Christ, and that he would make us alive in our hearts to one another inside the church and inside our marriages. I pray it by his powerful name. Amen. Amen.